Welcome to Percival Baptist Church. Happy New Year, guys. Let's stand up. Are you guys glad it is not 2020 anymore? I think, uh, you know, here's to hoping that 2021 is a good year. No matter what comes our way this year, we still have the same hope that the Lord Jesus is here for us. He is the God who loves us. We're just going to worship him and just declare that it is finished here this morning. together.
away through the desert. He is good to us. He is the one that no matter what situation we find ourselves in, no matter what mountains we face, he makes a way. Not always away from them, but sometimes through them. He is faithful even in the midst of those trials. Sing together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh Jesus, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Just sing to him, you are here, touching every worship you, oh, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, oh, I worship you, Lord. You are here, 
don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. ourselves of who our hope resides in. Our hope is in the Lord. We don't trust in princes and mortal men who can't save. We trust in the God who makes a way through the desert, who makes a way in the middle of the fire, who makes a way even out of the grave. So I'd love to just pray over us right now as we begin this new year. Lord Jesus, thank you so much you are our hope, a hope that is alive forevermore, our hope that is seated on the throne, our hope that has power over sin and death, our hope that has power in our lives to help us to overcome the sin that so easily entangles us. Lord, you are the way maker. And we confess that here today. Yours is the power by which we live. And we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit to overflowing continually, Lord, so that here in 2021, we can make a difference for your kingdom and not be bound by anything. Lord, we love you. We exalt you. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated. Good morning, Percival Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Kevin. Can you believe we have turned the page on 2020 and are moving forward into 2021? During the second service, the elementary kids can head to the back of the sanctuary where you will find your leader. Let me officially welcome you today to our services, whether you're here or joining online. If you're new to the church and here in person, at the end of the service, please go to the back of the sanctuary and pick up your gift. And if you're watching online, text the word WELCOME to 540-277-9505, hit SEND, and then follow the prompts. This will give us a chance to connect with you after each service. Another great way for you to connect with us is through prayer. If you have any requests or needs, text PRAY FOR ME to that same number, hit SEND, and then follow those prompts. We have people in the prayer room who will pray for your need as soon as they get it. And our elders pray over each request every Monday morning. 
We start every new year here at PBC with 21 days of prayer. This year, our focus is how we are made for 2021. Starting today, we are asking you to join us as we talk to God each day. Specifically ask him what he wants for you this year, but also ask him how PBC might reveal Christ to our community. During these 21 days of prayer, you can join us every weekday morning at 7 a.m. as we do a live 15-minute devotional and prayer. The link can be found at perbath.org. You'll be able to submit requests and join with others each morning. Also, it is not too late to join us as we get to know God better by reading through the Bible in one year. You can get the link to download the YouVersion Bible app at perbath.org. No problem if you miss the first couple of days. Just start reading and join us today. And at last, if you want to know more about PBC, join us at Growth Track on January 24th from 4 to 7 p.m. We will share God's vision for our church, give you a great meal, and answer any questions that you might have. Come learn to know God better, to find freedom, to discover your purpose, and to help us make a difference in the community. 2021 is going to be a good year. God can use to do great things through you and in our church. And we're inviting you to join us. Let's prepare for Pastor Corey's message and keep each other safe by keeping your masks on during the service. Well, good morning. Happy New Year. I thought it was uh, altogether appropriate. We started our service with a song called It Is Finished. Isn't that ironic and so good? I know it's, it's about Jesus and we need to focus on that, but I thought it was appropriate for our first song of the new year after 2020 to sing It Is Finished, okay? I thought, that was pretty good. You know, that was clever. Taylor, I didn't, I didn't plan that. That was Taylor. Actually, Taylor wrote that song. Did you know that? How incredible. And uh, I thought it was awesome. So as, uh, as Pastor Kevin was saying, uh, today starts one of our favorite times of the year, 21 days of prayer. We love this time of year as we really focus in and dig in to the Lord. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that as we go today. But what we're calling this 21 days of prayer is Made for 21. The reason we're calling it Made for 21 is I believe that God is sovereign. God is in control. Do you agree with that? And so he created us in a specific time and in a specific season. And so as we are here on January 3rd, 2021, God made you for this year. He didn't make you thinking, oh man, how's he going to live through 2020 or 2021? He made you with this year in mind. And so it behooves us as a church, we talk about helping you discover purpose, is to ask God, how did you create me for this year? And so as we look back on 2020, we can, you know, dissect it and talk about all of the terrible things that happened and how hard it was, but I'm kind of tired of doing that. It's time to shift our focus and look forward and say, God, how did you make me for 2021? And what is God going to do this year? Because it's not all doom and gloom. God's at work. That, just, that song we were just singing, even when I don't see it, he's working. If you look back over the last year, I bet if you were intentional and took a few minutes, you could mark out quite a few ways that God worked in your life last year, couldn't you? You could see how he worked in our community and even in our country to do things uh, that we would have never expected, but God brought to the forefront. And I believe he's going to do that in 2021 as well. Do you agree with me? And so we're going to spend these next 21 days digging in and getting ready for that. After the 21 days of prayer, we're going to preach through a book of the Bible I've never preached through. We're going to preach through uh, Hebrews. We're going to start that after the 21 days of prayer. But for the next few weeks, we're going to focus on a theme of stories in Scripture that encapsulate a little bit of what we've just been through and prepare us for the days ahead. You could call 2020 a storm and the different storms that came our way. And as we look into this new year, I believe there's going to be more storms to come. There's going to be other things that are going to happen. And the question is, are we ready for them? And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is if you really take a second and think about it, there's quite a few stories in Scripture about storms and boats. 
And we're going to take a look at each one and what God has to teach us in preparing for whatever this year has to bring us. And so as we uh, get started into that, what do these names bring to mind? Do you remember the name Katrina? Does that bring very specific images to mind for you? It was 2005. I still lived in Texas. I can still remember we were just about four hours away from New Orleans where Hurricane Katrina hit uh, in, in kind of the most devastating way. 1,800 people died in that storm. There were 175 mile an hour winds, and it caused $125 billion in damage. People were flooding north, and um, all of our school gyms and places there in, in Texas were full of people just coming and sleeping on the floor because they had nowhere to go. You want to talk about a storm. How about this name? How many of you are old enough to remember Andrew? Do you remember Hurricane Andrew? In 1992, it hit uh, right around Miami, right, in South Florida. I was, a, I was a young kid, but I still remember 175 mile an hour winds, 27 billion in damage, one of the most devastating storms ever. Um, maybe this didn't hit our area, but do you remember Harvey? 2017, it wasn't the wind that was the problem, it was rain. Some places near Houston received nearly 60 inches of rainfall in less than two days. Can you imagine? And if you've never been to Houston, there isn't a hill in the whole city. It is flat as flat comes. And they don't have um, <laughs> drainage ditches. They have roads. They use the roads to clear water. That's the truth, actually. That's how they planned it. It's not a good idea in a hurricane. And um, so it was flooded completely, $125 billion in damage. How about some local storms? How many of you lived in Loudoun County during Hurricane Sandy? Do you remember Hurricane Sandy coming through? I still remember sitting in my living room make, uh, just about a month after we moved in, wondering if our house was going to make it. 115 mile an hour winds, 69 billion in damage. How many of you remember earlier that year, there was a little known storm called the derecho? Or how, how do you say that word? Derecho? Dere I'm from Texas, we don't speak right. Derecho. It, it can't, nobody expected it. it. had 90 mile an hour winds. We lost a tree in our yard. It was pretty wild. And then maybe the most fun one was snowpocalypse of January 2016. That was a good day, okay? 39 inches of snow. Incredible. Those are some pretty incredible storms. But probably the most famous storm in history is not found in meteorological records. It's found at the beginning of Genesis. And I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the most famous storm in all of history, Genesis chapter 7. And I'm going to share with you some details that the Weather Channel reporter would have shared standing there on the shore. That's my favorite part of every storm, by the way. Is like who drew the short straw from the Weather Channel to have to go stand on the beach and watch the thing roll in? That's my favorite part. But um, the, here's the details that the Weather Channel reporter would have shared in this storm in Genesis chapter 7. I want to recount the storm quickly for you, and I'm going to make some observations as we go. Genesis chapter 7, it says this in verse 11. It says, in the sixth hundredth year of Noah's life, verse 12 says, rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And in verse 15, it says, they, Noah, his family and animals went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And then I want you to look at what it says. It says, y'all read it with me. It says, and the Lord shut him in. God protected Noah, his family, and the animals through the storm. If Noah was going to make it through this storm, it had to be God. It reminds me of a psalm that a lot of people were quoting at the beginning of the pandemic, Psalm 91. It says that God, he, God, will cover you with his pinions and under his wings, these are like a bird's wings, um, he will, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. The imagery there is like a bird coming up underneath its mother's wings and like a, a, a soldier finding protection from the wiles of the enemy. So God protects his people. That's what Genesis 7 reminds me of. Where I grew up, we had tornadoes every year. Did anybody else grow up in like the Midwest or in the plains where, you, know, you remember in Indiana, right? There were tornadoes. We had tornado drills at school. 
We had tornado drills in my home, and you learned very quickly what were the right places to hide in a tornado and what were the bad places to hide in a tornado. My wife loves to tell a story of when she was a child and she was thrown into a closet and the door slammed behind her when a tornado was hitting their neighborhood because that was the best place to be. No windows, structurally sound underneath the stairwell in their home. It was the strongest and safest place to be. The safest place you can be in a physical storm is in a protected place. But the safest place you can be in a storm of life is in God's protection. That's the safest place you will ever find yourself. It says that the Lord shut Noah in. He was safe. God protected them in the storm. I'm going to quickly give you a hypothetical three-point sermon, okay? The first point of this hypothetical sermon is true, is that God protects during the storm. Noah's storm continues in verse 17. It says, the flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. Verse 20 says, the waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits. That would be about 22 feet deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Scripture tells us that the water was so deep over the entire earth that the tallest mountain was covered in more than 20 feet of water. And what did God do? God provided an ark for his people to save them through the storm. While others were experiencing death, they were saved because God made a way in the midst of death to bring life. And doesn't he still do that today? 1 Peter 3 tells us that while it was the ark that saved Noah, it foreshadows how Jesus saves us from death as well. And so if we're going to face a storm, we need an ark to rise above what could have killed us. God protected them in the storm. And the second point of our hypothetical sermon is this. Only God can save from the storm. One point further, verse eight, or chapter 8, verse 1, it says, God remembered Noah. I love that part of the story. And the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And verse 18 says, so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. So our hypothetical three-point sermon from this first storm is God protected them, God saved them, and God remembered them. That's the story of the storm. That's what the, um, the, uh, the weather channel you know, meteorologist would have been sharing as he stood there on the beach watching the waves come in and the rain fall. That's the story he would have told, and it's a great message. It is a faith builder. It's an encourager that God protects in every storm that we face. God saves us through the storm, and God will remember us. That will preach. But there's more to the story. See, a lot of people, when they look at the story of Noah, they remember a picture that looks something like this. How many of you saw this in a child's book growing up about the story of Noah and the ark? My favorite part of this picture is somebody thought it was cute to draw beavers in the front of the boat. That would have been a really bad idea, by the way. I don't know where Noah put the beavers, but it probably wasn't near the hole. <laughs> Digging a hole, eating a hole right in the middle of what's going to save them. I love it. It's really cute. They use nice, uh, bright colors for kids. In this picture, Noah is a little bit worried, but I've seen some where Noah is standing there smiling like a cruise ship director. Like everything is perfect, and it's, it's cute, and it's quaint, and it makes great for a child's story, but it's completely unrealistic, isn't it? Because all at one time, you want to talk about a pandemic, all in one moment, the rest of the world's population is dying. The water is rising to thousands of feet deep in 40 days. Not even Hurricane Harvey did that. With water rising so fast, you got to imagine this is not a three-hour tour on a luxury yacht. This was a seasick-inducing ride of terror. It was this non-idyllic scene that Noah found himself in. And so let me ask you this question kind of this way. Is that picture reminiscent of any storm you've ever ridden out in your life? Does that picture capture the scene of you riding out physical storms, or does it capture the scene of you riding out personal storms? 
Is this how you would draw your journey of 2020 or any other personal storm you have ever faced in your life? Would it come out looking like that? Noah, you got to imagine, years later as he was recounting this story with his family or sharing it with the people that came after him, he had to have had quite a testimony, didn't he? Think about his testimony. We love to hear testimonies of changed lives and how God brought people through tragedy. Can you imagine Noah's testimony? God had protected, God had saved, and God had remembered. But the question would be, how did Noah get here? How did he get that testimony? Because in his day, in the same storm, not everybody had the same result. You see, we, we like to look at Noah's story, the storm and the ark, through only the lens of it happening to Noah. But the truth is, there are a lot of other people that would have had a different testimony after that storm, wouldn't they? And so the question is, how did Noah get to the place where he found a seat on the ark? How did we get to the place where Noah was the one who was saved through this? How did we get there where this was his experience with the greatest storm in history? And then the question for us is how can we be sure that if this storm happens today, we'd be on the ark rather than the ones just trying to keep our heads above water? That's the question we really have to ask ourselves with the Noah ark story. So I want to back up a little bit before where we started, and I want to tell you how we got here. Go back to Genesis 6. It says in verse 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then in verse 8, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Some people would read verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And they would come to the conclusion that the reason Noah was selected for the job is because he was such a good guy. That if they put a lineup of people living in Noah's day, they would have picked Noah as being the best of the best. And by comparison to the rest of men, Noah was the good guy, and so he got the lucky ticket to get on the ark. That's what you might, you know, deduce from this. But this is an instance where if we dive a little bit deeper, it'll give you a little different look. That verse says that Noah found what? It says favor. It says he found favor. But I want you to look at Genesis 6, verse 8 in a different version. This is the King James Version. It says, but Noah found what? Grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The word favor is not an error. Don't hear me say that. It's not wrong. In fact, it's the word that most translations use. Uses the word favor. Um, the ESV uses that. The New American Standard uses that. The NIV uses that. The CSB uses that. The NLT uses that. But, but it's not the full picture as we understand the word favor today, is it? Because when we hear the word favor, I think of somebody who earned it. I think of somebody who deserved favor, and so they got it. But that's not completely the case here. Anytime you're reading Scripture, you probably know this, and if you're joining us in the one-year Bible reading, you definitely need to know this. If you're wondering what a verse means, the number one step is keep reading. Genesis 6, verse 9 says this. Noah, I want you to notice something. Notice the tense in this verse. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation, Noah walked with God. Noah was. Noah walked. This is who he was prior to verse 9. So let me stop there for just a second. If you encounter a storm in your life, you need to know something. You won't miraculously become a better person when the storm arrives. Have you ever realized that? That you are not going to suddenly make all the right decisions if you wait until the moment the storm arrives. You've got to make the decision, who am I going to be before the storm gets here so that when I get squeezed, the juice that comes out is something that's good. The writer of Hebrews is going to help us understand this a little bit better when it talks about Noah in Hebrews 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it tells us that Noah acted in faith. And through that faith, he inherited righteousness that comes by faith. 
In other words, Noah was the only person on earth who had chosen to walk with God. And it was because of his faith in him walking with God that he was righteous and blameless because he had received the grace of God. Scripture tells us very clearly that we are saved not by works but by faith. We are saved by faith alone, not by our works. Noah doesn't get on the ark because he was the best of the worst. Noah gets on the ark because he had found grace in the eyes of God. Because he had faith in the Lord and he walked with him. And this is the critical first step that protected Noah from the storm to come. This is the critical first step that prepared him for the storm. This was the critical first step that gave him the testimony after the storm, that God will protect, God will save, God will remember. All was predicated, began with this step. Noah having faith and walking with God and God giving him grace. Noah does not qualify for a ride on the ark if he does not first find grace in God's eyes. This is the first step. We call it knowing God. And the first step to knowing God will protect us and will save us is entering into a relationship with him. And if you're here today or if you're watching online, I want you to know something. If you have never entered into a relationship with God, if you haven't walked with God, and if you haven't received grace from him, then unfortunately you can't have confidence that this, everything's going to go okay in the storm. You can't have confidence that the storm is going to end and going to be totally okay afterwards. You're at the mercy of the waves. You're at the mercy of the wind that's going to blow in 2021 like it did in 2020, like it did in 2019, and in every other storm you have ever faced in your life since the Garden of Eden. You are at the mercy of that storm. But if you're a believer here today, if you're a believer watching online, you know that every storm, is a temporary storm, isn't it? Every storm does have an end. Every storm will be wiped away one day. Every travesty will end. God will wipe away every tear. Not even death is the end. Scripture says, though sorrow may last for a night, joy comes in the morning. And if you are a believer who walks with God, you have the testimony of Noah. You know that every storm is a temporary storm. It's why Paul sang and why Peter slept in jail. It's why they didn't stand up and scream and cry. It's why Daniel entered the lion's den with peace. It's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't sweat the fiery furnace. It's why Esther boldly approached the king is because they walked with God and they knew that every storm is a temporary storm if you have faith in the Lord. I want you to imagine, if you were in a real storm in a real boat, the storm begins to come in, roll in, and the waters begin to rise, and you're on the boat, you have two options. You can cut the rope that's tying you to the pier, or tying you to whatever you are you know, tied to. You, you can cut the rope and go out and ride the waves. In fact, that's some of the best recommendations for boats and storms. During um, Hurricane Sandy, the Navy sent 27 boats out to sea to ride the storm out on the waves because that was the safest place for them. That is an option you have. But the second option is you better have a really good anchor. If you're going to stay lock solid in the midst of a storm and not be crashed or bashed or torn apart or sunk, you better have a really good anchor. And if you're a Christian here today, here's what Hebrews 6 says. It says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone. If you're going to prepare for the storms to come, you better get yourself an anchor. Noah did. He walked with God before the storm hit. And so what I want to invite you into is over the next 21 days, priority number one of this year is walk with God. It's to make that the number one priority every morning of the next 21 days. 
I know people will say, well, you can read scripture in the evening or in the morning. I just want you to know that Jesus, is, Jesus had a good example of getting up early and reading God's word. I find that when I start my day with God's word, I start off on the right foot rather than trying to correct it at the end. So it's not evil to read it at night. Maybe do both. Let's do that. But it is a good idea to start your day before you look at your phone, before you do anything else, to dig into God's word and walk with him as he prepares you for the storm ahead. At PBC, we've been reading the one-year Bible together for years. And one of the things that I've learned through the leadership here is more often than not, if I face something unexpected in a given day, God probably, in his sovereignty, gave me a verse in that morning's reading that will help me be prepared for that that day. And if you haven't been anchored in God's word already that day, then you're on the waves going with whatever the day brings you. But if you've got an anchor that can't change, that you started the day with, you're prepared for the storm. And so over the next 21 days, I want to encourage you to dig in and join us. And then look at something else from the storm. It says in chapter 6, verse 13, another way that he was prepared. It says, And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now notice the details God gives. Verse 14, he says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark is 300 cubits. That's about 450 plus feet. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. Set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. The storm that Noah faced would be the longest storm in history. It would rain for 40 days and 40 nights. But do you know some of you Bible scholars out there, how long did Noah and his family actually spend on the ark? Do you know? It was more than a year. Noah and his family end up on the the ark for more than a year if you read the story carefully. And, And oftentimes, isn't that true about storms in our lives? Is they last, the effects last a whole lot longer than the actual event. Have you ever noticed that? The impact lasts exponentially longer than the event itself. A year on the ark, that's a long storm. But how long did it take Noah to build the ark for that year? Well, we can't nail it down exactly, but it's somewhere between 50 and 120 years it took Noah to build the ark. That's how long it took him to prepare for a storm that would only last 40 days with effects up to a year. In other words, his preparation time was at least 50 to 1. Can you imagine if Noah procrastinated? If he waited till the first raindrop fell to lay the first beam? If he's standing there with hammer in hand, saw in hand when the storm began and thought, oh, God was for real. What if he procrastinated preparing for the storm until the storm happened? If he had to scramble and do it all at the last minute. Keep in mind that there's no yacht clubs and boats weren't a thing during Noah's time. Scholars aren't even in unity about whether it had ever even rained before Noah. If It would have been a widely unpopular thing to begin building a boat on dry land in the middle of a field when nobody had ever seen such a thing. I want you to imagine what this would be like today. What if we cast a vision, the elders of our church cast a vision for 2021 and said, hey, we're going to go out into the backfield of the church and we're going to build a spaceship. And the reason we're going to build the spaceship is the community comes by and says, why are you building a spaceship? As we told them, it's because we believe God told us we were going to need it really soon. Could you imagine what that would be like? We would be known as the spaceship church. Like we'd have to change our name. And it wouldn't be just for a week or a month or a year. This would last 50 to 120 years. Your parents would have called it the Spaceship Church. Your grandparents would have called it the Spaceship Church. That's what it would have been like if we, if we were being like Noah in his day. But yet he does it. He starts building this boat. Can you imagine what people thought, what people had said? You want to know something? If you're going to ride out a storm in a way that nobody else does, You've got to be obedient in ways that no one else is willing. 
If you're going to be ready for a storm that nobody else is prepared for, you've got to be obedient in the beginning when it doesn't make sense and it isn't popular. But in the unique obedience God was asking of Noah, he's preparing Noah for something he could have never foreseen. Notice the detail that God gives in the text. God told Noah to use a very specific kind of wood. He said to use gopher wood. We would call that uh, probably cypress wood today. And if you have ever cut down a cypress tree, you remember. Because it is one of the hardest, most difficult woods to work with. And you probably had a chainsaw. You probably had a very modern piece of equipment to do it with. Imagine Noah getting this message that he was supposed to build this big of a boat out of one of the most difficult to work with woods with the kind of saws they had back then. But little did he know that he was preparing it for one of the most tumultuous storms that would ever happen. God told him very specifically to cover it with pitch. Pitch is a waterproof glue-like substance. I did the math. It is a minimum of 81,000 square feet of surface area that Noah and his family had to uh, put this glue all over by hand. They didn't have Wagner spray guns. They didn't have roll-on rollers with extension poles. They had to put on this glue-like substance by hand over that vast of an area. That was a sticky situation. And then the sheer size of the boat with three decks would have been unfathomable to Noah, but it would provide room for the animals he didn't know were coming, and it would have created compartments to keep the boat buoyant in case it took on any kind of water. God, in his brilliance and in his sovereignty, left no detail unturned to prepare Noah for something he didn't know was coming. What if Noah had missed a point? What if Noah had said, cut a corner and said, I won't do the pitch? What if Noah had said, not that big, which animals is he going to leave off? Noah had to be obedient in all of these minute details. God gave Noah details that probably didn't make sense to him. He wasn't a boating expert. God was preparing him for something he had never seen. What if Noah had required that he fully understand before he obeyed? There's no way he could comprehend what God was doing. Jesus said this one time. He said, one who is faithful in very little is faithful in much. Because Noah was faithful to swing the hammer and cut the wood as God said, God used Noah to save his whole family, the whole earth, and brought him through this crazy storm. And so if we are going to be ready for the storms that are to come in this upcoming year, we've got to ask ourselves, What areas of small obedience do we need to make good on today? We can't wait till the last moment to cram session understanding God's word. We can't wait till the last moment to cram session trying to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives. We can't wait till the last moment to cram session on how to be prepared to be a husband or prepared to be a wife. We can't wait till the last moment to prepare for how to lead our kids through challenging situations. You can't wait till the storm comes. What areas of obedience do you know God wants you to be working in right now, knowing that God will be using it to prepare something that you don't know is coming yet? So I want to invite you over the next 21 days to dig in, walk with the Lord, and make good on some of these areas of obedience. Focus for 21 days. God, I will do what you've called me to do. And verse 17 says, Behold, in chapter 6, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that's on the earth shall die. God tells him to bring his family, the animals, and the food onto the ark, and it says, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. There are once-in-a-lifetime storms. Sometimes they'll call storms 100-year storms. You've heard that? Sometimes they're 1,000-year storms. Noah faced a once-in-history kind of storm. But unfortunately for us here today, we can't expect that kind of rarity. See, Jesus told us the opposite. He said that in this world, we are guaranteed to have trouble. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. We don't have to wait very long. We can just walk outside here just after this service and you'll probably notice it. You probably know it right now. We're guaranteed for these storms. And so the question is, 
are we ready? In 2018, Hurricane Michael slammed into the Gulf Coast. The eye of the storm landed um, right beside a little community called Mexico Beach. It was a devastating storm. It was on October the 10th. It had sustained winds of 160 miles an hour. It would go on to kill 74 people. It caused $25 billion in damage, including $6 billion in damage to the uh, fighter jets at Tyndale Air Force Base that are right there on um, the, the, uh, the coast right there. But once the sky cleared and people came to assess the damage, they found a very curious thing in the aftermath of the storm. Right there on the beach, right there in, the, in, in Mexico Beach, there was one house that was right on the ocean. That's the beach right in front of it. Everything else is destroyed around it. You can only see some buildings a few blocks back that had maybe been buffered a little bit from the wind. But everything else, the other houses that are there are not where they're supposed to be. They've been moved off of their foundation, and you can tell that plenty of other structures have been completely obliterated. Of course, the uh, reporters went and found the people who built this house because they had questions. Russell King and LeBron Lackey built that home just a couple of years before Hurricane Michael. And they asked them, what did they do? The pilings that are underneath the home, they said they drove them over twice the depth that was required by code. They took them to 40 feet deep in order to give it a good foundation. The entire house is uh, not built with just studs and sheetrock. It's built with reinforced concrete with, uh, with uh, steel cables and rebar throughout the entire thing. They even encased the corners of the building in extra concrete to make it stronger. Everywhere that they could have used a nail, they used a screw instead. The space underneath the roof was minimized so that wind couldn't get underneath it and lift it up off and tear the roof off. They asked them how much it cost. They said it cost us approximately an extra $30,000 to build it that strong. And here's what Mr. Lackey said. He said, when we built the house, we wanted to build it for the big one. We just never knew we'd find the big one so fast. I thought of this house and this storm as I was preparing for today's message and as I was thinking about 2021 and what image we want in our mind as we know the storms are going to come, what kind of house do we want to build? And how do we want to be prepared for it? I want you to know if you're going to take the step to be prepared for storms, it's going to cost you up on the front end. It's going to cost you more today. It's going to cost you time and money. It's going to cost you effort. You're going to have to put in a little effort over the next 21 days to be ready, but it is worth it. Because Jesus told us the storms were going to come. They will this year and the next and the next. But we've got to do the work today to be prepared for that reality. And so I want to invite you to participate over the next 21 days as we preach on storms and boats for the next few Sundays. As we talk every weekday morning at 7 a.m., just for 15 minutes, come and join us. We're going to pray together to try to prepare for that day. One of our pastors is going to lead that. And then one radical thing I want to invite you to is for the next three weeks, I want you to consider the spiritual discipline of fasting. Scripture is clear. We're called to fast at times. And each January we do this because it's, it's the goal here is to set aside the physical desire and need to take up what we know spiritually we need. Set aside the physical to take up the spiritual. There's multiple ways you can do fasting over these next 21 days. Don't, don't, don't fret, don't be afraid. You can do a full fast. I know many people who have done that in our church before where it's liquids only. You probably ought to talk to your doctor before you do that. But you can do that for 21 days. You can do um, the judges fast where you uh, fast every day from sun up to sundown. You eat before the sun comes up or after the sun goes down each day. And in the middle of the day, anytime you get hungry, it's just a reminder to, to pray, to seek the Lord, to walk with him. Uh, another way you can do it is uh, what we call the Daniel fast. Taking up a specific set of food or certain items or, or, or maybe even not even food, something else that you want to eliminate from your life for the next 21 days to help you focus on the Lord or, or maybe for physical reasons or whatever else, you can do the Sabbath fast. That's the fourth, fourth way where you take up one day a week 
you set it aside, maybe Sundays, and say, this is going to be my day. Whatever it is, I just want to invite you in over the next 21 days as we seek the Lord, as we prepare for the year ahead, as we make good on the acts of obedience as he's called us to, and as we walk with him to prepare for whatever he's going to bring our way. Would you pray with me? God, I want to thank you that you've told us ahead of time storms are coming, and we have the opportunity today to make the decision to walk with you now. And we have the opportunity today to make good on the area of small acts of obedience you've called us to so that we're ready for the big acts of faith that we know will come. Thank you, God. You didn't surprise us. You've told us. And so, God, I pray that you'd give us the courage that, not, that we would start over the next 21 days to walk more closely with you, to be obedient to you, to learn from you. And I want to pray for anybody here today who is uh, wondering, who has never found a relationship with the Lord, who has never found grace in God's eyes like Noah did. If you're here today, it is true. You don't know what the storm will do for you. You can't have confidence because the first step is knowing God. And so if you have been tossed by the waves and you recognize your own brokenness and your sin that separated you from God and you don't know the way out, I want you to know Jesus is the only way. It is true, God makes a way and he saves out of the storm, the storm of life. He will save us from death and hell if we would place our faith and trust in him. He tells us we need to repent and turn back to him trust him to save us, confess that Jesus is Lord, believe that he died on the cross and rose again for us, and you'll be saved. So you can pray right now in your own words, God, I turn back to you. I'm trusting you to save me, not myself. I confess Jesus is Lord. I believe he died on the cross and rose again. Come into my life and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here and made that decision, we'd love for you to let us know. Just text the word decision to that number or come let me know after the service. But as a church, we take communion every Sunday. And here's what I want you to think about. If you're here with us today or if you're at home, just take this moment to reflect, maybe pray together as a family. Uh, but what we're gonna do is take communion where we have bread and juice that reminds us of Jesus's body and his blood broken and spilled for us. And as we think about how Noah found grace in God's eyes, I want you to think about how we have found grace in God's eyes. The only way that we are saved from the death that everyone else may experience, that everyone is destined to experience, is by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He is our ark. He is the one who saves us. And so as you think about the flood, think about Jesus, what he did to help you find grace in God's eyes. You take communion when you're ready, and then we'll worship together in a moment.
In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt why we can have hope in the storm is knowing that what Jesus has done has made a way for us through every storm that we are to face. And so I want to encourage you as you go today to prepare your hearts for whatever is coming this year to step in with us over the next few days as we seek the Lord together. I want to remind you, you can give as you go and thank you for your faithfulness and giving over the last few weeks. Um, we were uh, blown away by year-end giving and can't wait to see what God does with every dollar that is given. If you're a guest, we'd love to meet you at guest reception. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we thank you that every storm is a temporary storm if we've placed our trust in you, that we can walk out of this place knowing that we have a shelter, someone to run to, and help us to do that now even before the storm comes. Help us to dig into you over the next few days. Help us to set aside the physical to take on the, sp the spiritual. And Father, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would firm up our foundation as we press into and walk with you. We love you in Jesus' name.
God bless you. You're dismissed.